Today I have the privilege of introducing our speaker for our April lecture, Dr. Jan McLeod, who has uh, <coughs> a regular, three over times, holds a PhD in history from the University of Newcastle, where she worked in academic, research, and professional positions across various faculties since 2001. Prior to this, she was a secondary school teacher, adult community educator, and student nurse. In 2021, Jan retired to pursue her own research and writing. Her first book, Shadows on the Track, Australia's Medical War and Pucker, 1942-43, was published in 2019 as part of the Australian Army History Collection. In 2020, Jan was awarded an Australian Army History Research Grant to assist with the writing of mopping up the casualties, caring for Australian soldiers in the southwest Pacific area, 43-45. Jan's most recent publication, which we have copies of at the back of the room, All the Broken Soldiers, Private Kennedy War, was released in November of 2022. This book is based on the wartime diary of her great uncle, who served as a medical orderly with her second fourth Australian Army field handles during the Middle East and Southwest Pacific. If you can put our hands together to welcome Jan to the panel. So today's presentation um, is based on the story of three years in the life of my great uncle. His name, full name was Lawrence Nicholas Kennedy. Everyone knew him as Nick, he was my uncle Nick. Uh, and his older brother Bill also served with him through the war in, in the second fourth field ambulance in the Middle East and across the Southwest Pacific between 1940 and 1945. So the small uh, diary and photographs that he kept Convey the experiences of a young man from the central coast of New South Wales, exploring the world as it opens up to him under the clouds of war, and they focus on his first couple of years as a medical orderly, so it doesn't follow him right through, and it's a bit sporadic the way it's written, but that adds to its charm. Um, so my aim today is just to give you a bit of a potted history, if you will, of his time in Palestine, Egypt, Syria, and Papua, as told through his words and photos. So pretty much all of the photos, there might be a couple on my more formal slides, but most of the photos are his. Um, some of them have been reproduced in the book, but because it's black and white, I mean they're black and white photos, but they're not, they're a bit grainy, they're not always as clear. So I just, it's a great, it's the first opportunity I've had to share his photos with, with people wider than the family, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, so when he was in the Middle East, Nick wrote relatively little, but he actually took a lot of photographs. But when he was up on the Dakota track, it was the opposite. I'm surprised he could write anything. I'm surprised he could take any photos. But it actually flipped and he, and he seemed to write more, especially as he went along. And he took less photos, obviously, I guess, as it got more and more challenging for him. I have no idea where the camera came from, no idea where it went, whether it was his, I don't know. Um, but to me, that, that difference tells you a bit about his mindset as well. And it's pretty much determined my approach to the presentation. So the first part, there's a lot more photos. Second part, there's more of his writings. So strangely, the first 
about to work in the eye. Mm, it's a trigger. trigger. It's the trigger. And at the bottom. Yes, that neck. This is built. So it builds down the bottom. I always tell me by those frown lines <coughs> on his eyes there. When he puts that hat on, it seems to put those frown lines in there. So Wednesday the 27th of May, 1940, was when they travelled by train from Wyong to enlist at the Engineers Drill Hall in Moore Park, Paddington. Army records show that Nick was a single man of 24 and his occupation on his attestation form was given as mental nursing. And worryingly, perhaps, his permanent address was given as mental hospital, Forks River. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, I'm going to try. 32-year-old um, Bill was married. His occupation was laundry at the same, he his said P Island, Forks River his address, and they were both assigned as nursing orderlies to Specialist Group 2 at the headquarters company of the 2nd Force Field Ambulance, which was part of 7th Division AIF. So just a couple of more formal, just to give you an idea, you're probably way over it, you probably know all these things, but just to give you a quick idea of where the medical corps and the field ambulance fit within the service corps. So you've got your arms corps, so this is the service corps here, these are some of the parts of that and then down off the medical service you've got medical nursing, dental etc. Field ambulance is sitting down here. So it took me quite a while to figure out the army structure. <laughs> I don't, yeah. don't quote me on anything I say. I still have to say brigades then battalions. I mean I'm not I don't pretend to be a military historian by any means. I have not worked it out. I have not worked it out. I had to draw pictures. But yeah I gave it my best shot. So, <laughs> so just basically giving you an idea that if you don't know what the field ambulance did, that they their responsibilities were to establish and man a series of medical posts or stations that were located progressively back from the front line. So you had regimental aid posts, main dressing stations, um, advanced, sorry, advanced dressing stations, main casualty clearing stations, and then back to the hospital, which was usually in the base area. So the sick and wounded passed through all of these for treatment with the ultimate aim to get them well enough to return to the fighting, but if that wasn't possible, then to evacuate them back to the hospital or back home if they were very lucky. Uh, so again, another picture of me trying to work out the structures. Um, so the officers in the field ambulance unit were medical doctors, and the other ranks, they weren't all medical roles. So there was a variety of roles within the field ambulance. There were the nurses or the medical orderlies, there were the stretcher bearers, the transport, the drivers, the cooks. Um, we're just talking about in, in the history of the field ambulance, they were often the, what's the kind word? Mm, don't know. But the veterans, the less able, they were originally, like in the Napoleonic times and Civil War times, they were often the band people. Um, they weren't the fighting soldiers. It was like, you'll do this and pick up a stretcher. So it wasn't based in those days on medical training, but that did move on and evolved as we went on. So the old and bold. The old and bold. I like that. I might use that myself. Old and bold. Um, so yeah, uh, so when in 1940 in May, Lieutenant Colonel Stanley Haynes Lovell was appointed the commanding officer of the 2nd Force Field Ambulance and was joined at Ingleburn Camp in New South Wales by Captain Vickery and Captain Munro Scott Alexander. There was also a female nursing sister and 10 female nurses from the 5th Australian General Hospital who were temporarily attached. This is where it comes in with the idea that we needed more medical training. So often, the, the interesting thing is these men were caught between two worlds in a few senses in that there weren't male nurses. They were generally, like my uncles, with psychiatric nursing. So um, often there was a bit of resentment, which is interesting, an interesting twist on gender bias. The, the female nurses often resented these men coming into that domain, and then there was a bit of resentment or um, looking down, on, I guess, from the fighting men on these men who were going to war without a gun. They weren't there to fight. So it, that's an interesting study in itself, I think. Um, so where am I here? I've wandered on. Yeah, so the, the established, the nurses came in to help with the training, the new recruits, and then Bill and Nick were amongst those who marched in. By the end of May, there were 12 officers, 242 other ranks, so a total of 254 uh, came 
came from a wide range of backgrounds and occupations and initially tasked with the medical support of the 20th Infantry Brigade. Brigade and underwent five months of intensive training alongside these soldiers before they left for the Middle East with them. So just a quick summary of the main points that I've gone over there. But the ones that I've highlighted, I guess, is the fact that they were non-combatants. Um, so they're unarmed. They could carry a weapon to protect themselves and their patients. Um, and also the point that mobility was a defining feature. If you keep that in mind, once we get to Papua and you think of how that was going to be confronted by the terrains in Papua, the important thing was that they were going to keep up and they were all just behind the fighting soldiers. So you can see once that's impacted and impact the sort of work they could do. So a few photos there from the training, firstly at Ingleburn and then Bathurst. So they had theoretical and practical instructions in topics such as anatomy, gas warfare, medications, treatment of head and abdominal wounds. But they also undertook the physical training that the fighting soldiers did. They had long route marches, carrying stretchers and other equipment. In one particularly grueling training exercise, they provided medical care for the brigade as they made their way over the Blue Mountains on foot to Bathurst between the 12th and the 29th of August. It was roughly 200 kilometres in the middle of winter while they were carrying 14 kilograms of equipment. So then it got really serious once they got to Bathurst. Bathurst, their exercise regime increased until the huts were cleared out in October. The men were assembled, ready to embark um, with the units of the 20th Infantry Brigade from Darling Harbour on the 9th of October. And they got their standing orders and their duties as they got ready to sail on the Aquitania in support of the brigade. So, oh, there it is. That's Nick there in the middle. This is Nick here with an unnamed lady. Nick with uh, his mate exploring around the area. And that's the photo we took as they left Eagleburn Station, apparently. Just a bit of an idea there of the, the program. This is a blurry old photo I took the night before I got rid of the taking photos of the longer one. So, they headed off on the Aquitania, which had been stripped of all the fittings of her past life, which was one of the famous Cunard Lines, Cunard Lines luxury liners. Then she went and served as a troop ship in Gallipoli, set off Gallipoli in World War One, came back as a passenger ship, stripped again and refitted to carry soldiers around the world for war. Fairly well equipped from a medical perspective with a dental surgery, a dispensary, main hospital, isolation hospital and bulk medical store. On board you had almost 3,000 soldiers. The second fourth nominal, nominal role shows they had a total of 224 personnel. And they took with them 100 tons of equipment. But they were always under strength. They never were at the full strength, which was around 254. So only slightly under that stage. So apparently they had an enthusiastic send-off from Woolloomoo Wharf on the 20th of October. Sailed as part of a convoy. Stopped at... Um, Fremantle, but their commanding officer said it was undoubtedly the most stirring and memorable occasion in the life of the field ambulance up to this date. So while they were on board, they were still working. Um, they were responsible for the medical. There were some female nurses on board as well. But they had treated a, a whole list of illnesses and injuries on board. Um, they had a range of cases. Uh, they had 656 cases reported, 207 of the soldiers had upper respiratory tract infections, 100 had various foot problems, 51 cuts and abrasions, 45 or so for dental, quite a few boils and abscesses, which tells you about the nutrition, I guess, and interestingly, two gunshot wounds. I don't know what happened there. It said it, said it brought secondary treatment. I don't know what primary treatment was. I think he was mucking up there. So again, that's photos on board. That's Nick without his hair. Yeah. <laughs> it's all been shaved. And that's him there with hair. This is him there. That's just a general shot of the board where they're washing hanging out. But just the fact that we've got these photos, I haven't seen them. I haven't seen them. I haven't seen them in any of all memorial collections anyway. So they're sailed by India. Had 10 days or so at Dialali Camp in the northeast, had a few days leave in Bombay, had plenty of warnings about BD and frequenting brothels, which I don't know that they paid a lot of attention to, judging from the medical record. Um, of course, they were amongst the thousands of Australian soldiers who landed there, so 
quite an experience with Bombay. Um, most of these guys had rarely travelled across state borders, let alone beyond Australian shores. And Kennedy brothers were no different in this. So the photographs show Nick and Bill and their mates posing with the locals. Suggest they were keen to engage with the people, the sights, the sounds and the smells of India. In the book there's quite a few descriptions from other soldiers of being overwhelmed by the smells and the different sounds of, of India. The general health of the soldiers was described as still excellent, but there were some casualties, colic, diarrhea, measles and things like that. So, um, I think in this one, that's Bill there, that's Nick there on the end. And they're in there, that's Nick and Bill there. I think Nick's here without his hair there. And that's just one of their mates. I was really good. I was surprised how quite clear they still are. Uh, so, time constraints mean I have to assume some knowledge of the Middle East campaigns. Um, so, can I assume that? <laughs> I can skip a few pages that way. Um, so we've got an idea of what went on with the, with the Middle East campaign generally. Um, so by early January 1941, so they arrived there towards November 1940. By early January 41, the Australians were, with the British, were fighting and winning their first battles in and around Bardia. And um, by 22nd of January, Tobruk had fallen to British and Australian troops. So during that time, there'd been three field ambulances providing the medical service throughout the Battle of Tobruk, and the main dressing stations there treated hundreds of wounded soldiers and frontline surgery undertaken there undoubtedly saved lives. So, So by this time they transferred to a different ship, the Christian Lugans, and they entered the Suez Canal, 23rd of November. Uh, moved slowly along the canal, it took approximately 13 hours in those days to navigate that 100 mile canal, and they anchored below Al Kantara in Egypt a couple of days later. Disembarked, travelled to Camp PR 89 at Gaza Ridge in Palestine. And this was their home for the coming months, while they underwent final training and preparations to enter the war zones. And so it had been five weeks since they'd left Sydney Heads. So December 1940 was a busy time um, because a high percentage of the brigade they were supporting had fallen ill. They had 136 new admissions they were dealing with, with the week ending 40th of December. And sometimes they had almost 20 casualties admitted on a single day. So obviously that was mostly sickness, the diarrhea and dysenteries and malaria, probably not at this early stage, but later on. They still had to complete their full training syllabus, they still had to do long route marches, night marches, map exercises, field craft. They had Christmas Day and Boxing Day off, and by the end of the year, Lovell noticed that the pressure on his unit had eased somewhat and the admission numbers were down. So they had leave. Uh, Nick was one of those who visited places such as Tel Aviv and Jerusalem on day tours. And as a Catholic in these ancient lands, he was drawn to the holy sites of Christianity. As, and he also showed an interest, though, in Judaism and Islam in his diary. He talks about, acknowledges their holy places as well. But what's interesting to me is he seems to interpret the stories of the Bible literally, and he accepts their veracity unquestioningly, unquestioningly, and his wonder and excitement and awe still remains tangible when you, when you read his diary. So he talks about in Bethlehem, in Bethlehem we viewed the spot where Christ was born and the manger he was laid in. This consists of a big area with the very old historical church built over it. We also visited the Mount of Olives. We viewed the spot where the shepherds watched their flocks by night and the three angels appeared as a star and directed them to the spot where Christ was born. Bethlehem is undoubtedly regarded as the most sacred place of it on earth. So I just think he just seems to be just overawed by the fact that he's there and it's just so literal to him. Um, so by April 41, so that's them, sorry, in the, in the camp. Um, they did a lot of digging, that's Nick there. Uh, there he is up the back and that's Bill next to him. There he is there. That's Nick there and Bill in over the back. Yeah, he always seems to be lying over the back there. Yeah. But they still look, still look quite fit and happy and apart from all their digging in the desert. So by April 41, um, to 
Brook was regained by Axis powers along the siege of Tobruk that began dragged on till November. And in May, medical personnel and transport details from the field ambulance ferried the sick and wounded soldiers between Mersa Matra and the railway station for evacuation by train at least twice a week. And Nick was among the nursing orderlies who were allocated to motor convoys, transporting troops and equipment to various locations as the situation escalated. On his 25th birthday in April 41, he uh, it was memorable for all the wrong reasons. He began the day amidst the burning sands in the Western Desert, but he ended it in a hospital bed at the 64th British General Hospital in Alexandria. And this marked the beginning of a six week period of illness and recovery. He was in for, um, I think that time it was uh, dysentery, diarrhea. Um, his health issues coincide with his unit moving from Kilo 89 at Gaza Ridge in Palestine to a staging camp outside Alexandria in Egypt, where they, a lot of them were struck by what was described as a mild but disconcerting epidemic of diarrhea, um, which they think they picked up from the train station food. Perhaps things don't change. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so this is actually Bill on the panel. This is Bill here with the kids. This is him, Pat had lollies here. And the kids are trying to jump up and get the lollies from him. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so they they were travelling around went on their days of leave here and they went to the Temple of Baalbek, which Nick describes in his book as well. Um, just fascinating place. I'm just thinking whether I've got time to do any of that. Sorry, I had all these pages marked, but I wasn't going to write too much. Um, so into the new year, they go and visit the Holy Mosque. Um, they talk, he talks about the age of all the buildings, the ancient buildings, and they go to this this ancient temple that was rediscovered. But what I loved about it is this photograph down here. They're on the top of it, that's Bill and oh, that's Nick in the middle there. And that, that's him there descending off the snows. This is the Temple of Baalbek as well. It's an amazing place. I had never heard of it. There's quite a bit about it in the book, so I won't go through it because I run out of time. Um, so by the time they were in Syria, they were tasked with the medical care of the 25th Brigade, and they stayed with the 25th right through after this point. Um, by this time, the Syrian campaign was pushing forward to El Arama, northeast of Beirut, as part of Operation Exporter, which was the invasion of Syria and Lebanon by British, Australian, and three French troops against the, the Vichy French. After five weeks of fighting, came victory and occupation in mid July. But in that final week of fighting around Damascus, it was the 2nd, 4th, and the 2nd, 6th field ambulance who treated over 400 casualties. By the end of the month, Nick was again unwell and evacuated to Beirut Hospital, suffering from mumps took another four months to recover and convalesce. By the end of the Syrian campaign, which at the start, the, the uh, officers were describing it as a gentleman's war, because we didn't really want to kill the French because they were our allies in the First World War. And it was a very strange war, um, the relationship, because it was French against French, and it was us against old allies, and it had this idea that it was some sort of more gentleman in the way it was fought, but in the end, over 400 Syrians were killed during that campaign. The field ambulance treated almost 1,500 casualties uh, from battle wounds and over 3,000 from illness and disease, including over 300 cases of malaria. But they learned important lessons in this campaign, which would see them you know, through Papua quite well in terms of the need for prop resuscitation, the need for fresh blood, the need for extra teams for forward surgery, um, all of those things, that mobility question became the key question, it was so obvious to them. Uh, with many thousands of Australians now tasked with the defence of what was known as the Tripoli Fortress, uh, many of those occupying troops fell ill, and this is where Nick spent the rest of the time in the Middle East. There were a few battle casualties, but we had motor vehicle accidents, skin complaints, illnesses, and finally in um, August, some Australian female nurses uh, arrived in Syria and Lebanon to ease some of the stress. 
this unit established itself in the buildings of what had been the Italiano Hospitale in Tripoli, which is this building here. Sorry, that just yelled up. Should I stop? Sorry. Yeah, it's all right. So the other medical units was dispersed around Beirut. The nearest hospital for treatment of the more serious casualties was back in Palestine. By November, Nick himself was a patient again, this time his commanding officer and, and the officer of his headquarters company, Fred Channel. They removed his infected appendix and had another long period of recovery. So he's had quite a bit of illness this whole time. So as 1941 draws to a close, leave was granted to play sports, explore the snow, share a few beer with, beers with mates and explore the ancient cities, Haifa, Damascus, the ruins, um, and they all captured Nick's diary and photo album. I love those photos of him having a snow fight. And um, I think he's in here somewhere. I think that's in there. Yes, that was on a day trip to Damascus. But there's some great photos in the album of um, the street scenes, just the everyday life in these places. So the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on the 7th of December 41 would go on to determine the fate of thousands of Australian servicemen and women, including the Kennedy brothers. So all up, Nick had spent two of the past seven months in hospitals and convalescent depots, away from his unit, and each time they got sick and they went to hospital, they then had to go and do some retraining, like refresher courses. So that added to the time away as well, but kept their skills up to date. And he was actually in hospital in Syria when he <coughs> learned of the Pearl Harbor attack. So by the time we get to his diary excerpt at the end of 41, there's a bit of weariness and perhaps some trepidation creeping in. I think the extreme Syrian winter was another reminder for him of the vast differences and distances between this land and the Yarralong Valley. Christmas in Syria was bleak and cold, and the excitement of exploring new lands seems to have faded somewhat. The pull of home seems strong, and he speculates on what the new year might hold, and he thinks that surely victory is on the horizon, which strikes you as particularly poignant when you know what happens in 42. But he writes about being operated on for appendicitis. And he says, Japan declared war on the 7th of December. Christmas 41 brings another Christmas abroad to us. Christmas Day in Syria was a bleak, cold day, and New Year's Day even colder still. 1942 looms in front of us. We look back on 1941 with its various happenings. No one would care to live it again on this side of the world. We all feel confident that 1942 is going to be a more victorious year than the one past. We see the old year out and the new year in. Bill, Snowbale, Henry Moore, Mal and I in an Arabic cafe in Almira, in Syria. <coughs> so that postcard was to my dad, who was a little boy who used to call me. Um, I think they're stuck, stuck, Bob and son. So Dad and his son and his two sisters, Laurel and Ash, were stuck on Wob. I don't know who was what, and I don't know why. But that's a precious thing to have found, too, in his photo album. So that's Nick, and he looks quite older and wiser there. Um, and that's Bill. I don't know where that one was taken, but I just thought that was a nice photo of him in the Middle East somewhere. There's a city in hand and the beer in front of him. <coughs> so the world's about to change yet again. So the Syrian snowstorms continue into January 42, and they are with the thousands of Australian soldiers travelling by motor convoy, train and on foot, back across the country, back into Palestine and Egypt, back to Port Suez by early February. And as the US troop ship Mount Vernon slowly pulls away from its first port of call at Aden on the southernmost point of the Arabian Peninsula, Nick and Bill Kennedy bid farewell forever to the heat, sand, wind and snows of the Middle East. So it's not until they're at sea and en route to Salon that those on board learn that Singapore had fallen to the Japanese. So after a few days leave, they explore Salon and Colombo. And they sail out of the harbour. They, come, they only learn that they're coming back to Australia while they're on board. Um, they learn that their first port of call is going to be Western Australia. 
So I won't go through all of that in that they come back to Australia. <coughs> this is those postcards of Nick's from Ceylon, Sri Lanka. Come back and then the story from there for the next little while is moving through from their stock at Fremantle, they go to South Australia to Woodside Camp, they move back up through New South Wales to Caboolture, to Petrie, to Woodford, up into Queensland. They must have some time of leave with their family, but he doesn't mention it. He doesn't talk about seeing family again after all that time, which is fascinating to me. The things that he doesn't say is interesting. Till finally they're up in Queensland. Uh, their training program by this time includes packing and unpacking equipment in the quickest amount of time, establishing medical stations quickly, examining blood for malaria and dysentery, and as it's called, Jack methods and how to combat them. So early September, they get their final period of leave, which is two days in Southport, and then they sail north, but they still don't know where they're heading. But we know that's where they were heading. So again, I have to assume um, prior knowledge of the campaign, but I'm sure that most people realise that the Japanese landed up around here towards the end of July, pushed their way down the Kokoda track, right down as far as the Yorub Island, and then the Australians went back as far as Inner Ridge, which is Alice Corner where the track crosses start, is Port Moresby down here. This little map here just shows you the location of the track in relation to New Guinea, Papua. So Awala was where we first, the Australians first engaged with the Japanese. So I won't go through all that in too much detail, but the section, interestingly, the section from Kokoda up here to the beachheads, that's known as the Kokoda San and Andrew track. So a lot of people basically just refer to the whole thing as the Kokoda track. Um, so it's, uh, where are we? So the Japanese forces landed near Goma, quickly pushed inland. So it was with an ad hoc force, Maruba force, that went into battle. We had militia as well as AIF. Interestingly, bugger all, to be frank, medical support. Um, a handful of members from the militia, 14th Field Ambulance, were detailed to head up there, but literally a handful. There was about six people originally. And I don't know if you've ever heard of Doc Burner, bit of a legend in those times. He was an old World War One veteran and he actually lived in Papua New Guinea on the Kokoda track, looked after a lot of the locals, and he was, in the end, he was responsible for the health of the carriers, the Papua uh, locals who worked as the stretcher bearers. And he basically came down and tried to help these guys who were going north to fight the Japanese with no medical support. Um, so it wasn't until September that um, when the Australians were withdrawing and the Japanese were advancing down to Yorubawa. Um, and the first um, group from the 25th Brigade actually went into battle or went back up on the part of the advance without any medical support either because this unit didn't arrive until a little bit later. Um, so if you can see on there the highlighted day, the 17th of September, that's when the Japanese push ended and we started to push them back. They were withdrawn back along the track. So that was the day that Nick came into Port Moresby with the rest of the unit. It was basically a turning point in the campaign. So what I was going to do for this part is just follow him from Port Moresby in September through to Kokoda in early November, because that's at Kokoda where his photographic record of the war ends, but his campaign is far from over, and indeed the unit's biggest challenges are ahead of them past Kokoda. And he continues his written account of the campaign through until mid-January. And his diary does reflect the language of the time, so he does refer to the natives and he does refer to the Japs, but that's the language of the time that he uses. So just quickly, some of the medical challenges. I mean, the geography alone, in short, was a completely different medical war than what they fought in the Middle East. Um, the key thing is that there was infrastructure in the Middle East. There was rail, there was transport, there were roads, there were airfields, there was hospitals. You had the British there, the French, you had a much more organised, much what we would recognise as a medical system happening. Terrain alone did dictate that this was going to be a much more difficult campaign. With the trinity of supply, treatment and evacuation of the casualties, one of the main, or the main three issues. My argument from the first book, um, 
is that we could have done better and could have done more. Uh, not everyone agrees with that. <laughs> I've been accused of benefit of hindsight, you know, but from what I've learnt, I reckon we could have done better. Um, and I think the key to why we didn't do better was the medical campaign was never a priority. It was never a priority. It was always, and especially, I'm not going to blame the government, I'll throw blame in as well, but obviously there was a war and, and the emphasis was on military, that makes sense. But yeah, the fact you, that, that, that you also had the Navy and his staff back in Australia who didn't appreciate the situation. That's right, yes, that's right. exactly right. right. And so they had lots of information beforehand. Everyone knew how bad the military was in the New Guinea. Everyone knew what would await. They had warnings that they'd be decimated. But anyway, I won't go on that thing for now. But my argument is that leadership issues and lack of priority actually helped as much as the terrain to make this such a difficult campaign medically. Um, so we can't talk about medical in, camp in uh, Papua without malaria, especially for the beachhead battles. It just decimated them once they got up there. Um, but the official medical historian, Alan Walker, recorded that more than 30,000 Australians suffered the effect of tropical diseases while they were in Papua. Over 21,000 of these were attributed to malaria, which is just stunning. And almost 100% of mixed units at the second floor field ambulance succumbed to malaria and other tropical diseases. And that's pretty much across the board. So I guess the point there, it's not just the fighting guys, it's every unit that's up there. And, they, and these guys are the medical guys who are trying to care for the sick and the wounded, and they themselves are just decimated by malaria and dysentery and all of those things. So amazingly, the troops themselves were often blamed for contracting the disease that was classed as a self-inflicted wound to get malaria. Don't get me started. Um, <laughs> but anyway, because uh, there was an idea that some of them were doing it deliberately contracting it to get back to Australia. The fact that they didn't have food and meth is all probably contributing. Um, so just another few points I'll rip through quickly. Just this is a normal treatment for when in battle, what you would normally do. The idea is to run it between the posts. Um, the surgical teams and some forward operating teams would perform the urgent operations. <coughs> then we evacuate the casualties back to the general hospital once they're fit to move. And that's in an ideal move, uh, in an ideal world. So you can imagine trying to do that up there. It just didn't happen. So it was like, they were so ad hoc, they had to extemporise, they had to adapt, they had to improvise. They really had to push to get forward surgery. Mm. Uh, they really did have to push because the traditional method of bringing them back to the base hospital was very much still what was recommended. And it was only these guys themselves saying, no, listen, we need to get to the guys, not bring the guys back to us. We really have to get out. And that was very brave of them. And they had bugger all to do it with. But anyway, they eventually won. So again, I won't rip through all of that, but um, that was the key points, but it didn't work the traditional way. So it was ad hoc, they had to improvise. So what happened was the medical groups were butted off into small groups. They either remained behind and cared for the patients, and then they were let, let frog, leapfrogged over to um, keep ahead and follow the fighting. So, um, this is about Nick's arrival in Moresby early, early September 42, 157 of them. So remember that they're about 100 short before they even start, about 100 short. Uh, so they've done their training, um, they arrived to support the 25th Brigade. He describes sailing from Brisbane, the rough seas on the voyage, and he talks about sleeping under the stars that night. Is that on that one? Yeah, he sleeps under the stars that night, find good water. So it's clear to them that they've got to make their way through this jungle country. So it's going to be a whole different world here. So I've just got some of these excerpts from his diary on these, because he writes much more in this. So early October, the trek, trek over the Island Stanleys begins. By this time, the soldiers are pursuing the um, Japanese back along the track. His writings in these first days centre on transportation, or rather the lack of any mechanical transport, <coughs> reliance on horses, mules, and the backs of men. So the deserts of Palestine and Egypt presented their own challenges, but at least, as I said, they had infrastructure. In this other world that was Papua beyond Port Moresby, it was horses and mules and men who carried so the horses and mules carried 600 tonnes of supplies as far as they to reach, and each animal carried up to 90 kilos at a time. So, yeah, he seems to be focused on, on those practicalities of things at that stage. 
I just love this photo of these guys relaxing in the stream. Um, and that, I'll just put the names there. I did my best to try and... Most of them are fairly, fairly clear. But it's just a classic photo of these young guys about to embark on this terrific trek. Um, so initially their task was to relieve the second six field ambulance at Alolo, in Lolo, and then push on past the Oral Bio to the 25th Brigade headquarters and establish a main dressing station further up the track. So first night they camp at this place called Supplies Dump 44, refresh themselves with a quick dip as the billy boils and as night closes in, they curl up on the wet ground using their ground sheets as blankets and sleep as the rain falls. Next morning they make their way through deep gorges and up the sides of the mountains, pushing on towards the Oroboro Ridge. So he's with a group of 70 or so who struggle to the top of Imeter Ridge via almost vertical sets of rough hewn steps known as the Golden Stairs. And there his mate, Private David Pride, poses just long enough to be forever captured in sepia in this photo, which I love. Carrying his pack, feet astride, pressing the large stick for balance. I just reckon you can tell he's an Australian. <laughs> I know it's a slouch hat, but he just looks like I'm off on a bit of a walk. Um, so yeah, they talk about the just the um, the challenge of actually getting up and over these ridges. Uh, so soon they're stumbling and slipping down the other side of Inter Ridge, marching on for a further six hours before they arrive at the bloody battle sites of the Oroboro. Beyond that, more seemingly endless jungles, slopes and ridges of the Magooli Ranges, and beyond that still the formidable Owen Stanleys. So he talks about oh, I should go to this one, shouldn't I? He talks about the um, the equipment that's left behind, abandoned Japanese equipment, bloodstained clothes, ammunition, tin hats, rifles, jack braves and the braves of our AIS that fell during the attack. So he talks about being the they really wanted to move on because the night was as black as pitch, they were there amongst all the dead, and it was the longest night they put in, but they couldn't move because it was too dark and it was too treacherous, so they had to camp amongst the dead there. So a small party from the unit established a small medical post a few days earlier to undertake surgery on the most serious of cases. The inner dentist generally acted as the anaesthetist. They didn't have an allocated anaesthetist. Um, Minari had seen vicious fighting during the Japanese advance. The village remained littered with the refuse of war, rusting weapons, rice, excrement, bloated decomposing bodies. They come across a small aid post with about 30 casualties being cared for by some field ambulance personnel. They have hot tea and jungle porridge, which is made from army biscuits with powdered milk. Spend a cold night there, and they have a half a blanket that they've been allocated. And one of the other guys from the field ambulance said, whoever came up with the idea of half a blanket, <laughs> should be made to go up there and give it, give it a go. You can imagine the cold. So yeah, just his descriptions of what it was like. To me, you can read about the campaign, but when you read it in the words of the guys who were there, it talks about the hardest day we've ever put in, the track becomes worse, it's like a precipice. And that last paragraph about the effects of smelting Japanese dead still lying around the side of the river. And then what we buried is just under the surface of the ground. I think it brings home to you that um, it's not just the fighting men that are confronted with these scenes. So in Bogey, small knoll deep in the valley, it was all but destroyed. The people had fled, the grass huts were burnt. They arrive here as night's falling. They're frustrated because they can't light a, a fire to boil the billy. They can't get out of the cold, the banishing and cold and the driving rain. They head for what they think might be a more pleasant camp, but the smell brings the smell of death to them of more decomposing bodies. And here we've got Privates Norm Lemke and David Pride, the guy that was on the, the Golden Stairs there, resting at what was later Ifogi Hills on this photo. And behind them, I don't know if you can make them out in the shadows, there's actually wooden crosses marking the recently dug graves of Australian soldiers. It's a bit hard to see because it's quite dark, but there's one there. So this is Fred Tiny Flowers. He's the, the, the Tiny was his nickname. He's the big guy standing down in the middle. 
Um, he was described as a six foot tall bullocky who preferred bare feet to boots and on long route marches invariably slung his number 13s over his shoulder. So they're here near Myola, and it was Myola where the field ambulance men really replicated the work, the work that they were there for, that they'd done in the Middle East, because Myola had earlier been identified as a good spot to set up main dressing stations. Because it was flat ground, they thought it would be a good area to supply and, and to be able to evacuate the patients. But the reality was it was boggy, it was wet, they couldn't bring the planes in, the planes tipped. So while you might be able to drop supplies, you couldn't actually land a plane to take the casualties out. So the field ambulances at Myola were stuck there. The second, fourth and the second, sixth basically leapfrogged each other. And the plan was that they would both go through to the beachheads. But because of this stuff up at Myola, the second, sixth basically had to stay there with all the patients, hundreds of them, until December. Uh, so the second, fourth went on to the beachheads alone. So Nick describes the primitive conditions Shortages of light, dry dressing, sterilising equipment to add to the challenge. Um, the sick and wounded who could possibly manage to walk were sent back on foot over the mountains and all the way back to Fort Moresby on foot, suffering horrific wounds. Um, and some of the field ambulance men described the trauma that caused having to be the one to order them to walk back because there was no way to evacuate them out, which is what I say about the, um, the priorities. <coughs> So yeah, he talks about working 18 hour days, um, seeing the abdominal wounds, the amputations, um, wonders how the human body can live being mutilated. You can just really hear it getting to him by this stage. But he does have admiration for the people that we refer to as the fuzzy wuzzy angels. Um, this does seem to be a general respect for the work that they've done. Um, their job was purely a stretch bearers. But the point to be made there, I guess, in terms of when we consider how much effort was made with the medical campaign, they were only ever intended to be carriers of supplies. Their role was never meant to be evacuating patients. It was purely through necessity that that's what they did. So we didn't ever really put in a proper evacuation plan. Um, so thankfully they did this, they did an amazing story, but it was born through necessity. So um, he talks about them and he talks about the passing of some of the patients and the role that the priest plays there, takes um, some of the lads pass away. He's always with them, but the last bit of life ebbs from them and their pain is no more. And that's where the title from the presentation comes. One wonders why all the strife should be. These men in their prime of their life cut down like flowers. He says there's a few mounds here with little wooden crosses over them, but their troubles are over. And here's his Christianity kicking in. A nice and better world awaits them. So I'm going to move this along and then have some time for questions. So they make it, they're still heading towards <coughs> Dakota. Uh, they leave Myola. They're heading forward. There's all this series of medical posts that they're stopping at, treating numbers of casualties, falling back ill, falling back wounded, getting some surgical treatment but can't be evacuated back. So all along the way, the field ambulance is losing people because they have to stay behind. It was at Templeton's Crossing that Nick learns, Nick learns that Dakota has fallen and he thinks this will be great where we'll be right now because we'll be able to evacuate the wounded and all will be well. So they've still got more, much more trekking to do. Once they finally set sail on Dakota, it is like the promised land. So it's the sun shining bright and making our way forward. Um, we know that the, the end's nearly in sight. So they finally make it to Dakota and that's a photo of the walking wounded at Dakota. And the bottom photo is of the, um, the medical dressing station at Dakota. But of course, once again, they get overwhelmed. It is better, they can get supplies in, they can evacuate patients. But what they're doing is bringing them forward from Myola and bringing them back from the fighting. So it's not long before they're overwhelmed. They had to expand it. The men of the field ambulance have been starving all this time, they've hardly had any food. So they get to Dakota and they say, you good, you'll get some food now. And Nick's excited because he says, the plane has already brought in new supplies, medical equipment, blankets, tents, and food supplies. And they brought in a small quantity of bread and we get a slice each. So he gets one slice of bread and he says it tastes, it tastes delicious after living on biscuits for some time. So they work together with the platforms to repair the airstrip. The planes come and go. They start to clear a few of them. The pressure is easing but it's not the end of Nick's war, but it's where Nick's record of photos and diary ends. 
So they get relieved at Dakota by the second six, um, but then the second force move on to Saputa. And it's here that, I'll just give you a quick idea what happens here. The most catastrophic thing that hits the um, field ambulance happens here, um, which is, uh, there's Saputa there. So that's how close to the front line they are. They can pop and dead the electric are evacuating people from by this stage. Dakota's back here, so they've made their way all the way here. The track gets slightly better, but what you do is enter all the marsh and malaria all the way over here. So what happens at Saputa when they think the worst is over is that they get attacked by Japanese planes. And this was the other piece of paper that was in that little ice cream bucket that I showed you at the start, and it fascinated me, and I needed to know what it was all about. So on the 27th of November, Japanese planes um, dropped a series of bombs and shot at the 7th Division headquarters, which was right near the medical dressing station. Another issue for another time. Uh, and also the Americans had a medical station nearby. So the attack was over in minutes, but the repercussions went as far as a royal commission, a uh, web commission in 1943, to determine whether it was a deliberate action by the Japanese and whether it constituted a war crime. They decided it didn't for reasons we can talk about later. But for Nick, the ramifications lasted a lifetime because to find that still there, he kept it, he'd drawn it. The date at the bottom is hard to read, but it looks like it's been done a long time after the war on that sort of paper. Down the bottom, it looks almost like a 1960s date, but it's a bit hard, it's all blotchy. It's pretty graphic. Um, it describes the terrible wounds that the guys <laughs> died from. It describes where they were hit, and that Saputa Cemetery, that's not there now. The bodies were disinterred and taken to Bamana. But that's the original cemetery, and you can see how far the line was extended um, from there. So he's marked in where all the, the graves were of his mates that were killed in that attack. So Bill and Nick were both there caring for all the casualties. Bill was responsible for burying a lot of their dead. And so in the book, I actually, this book, I concentrate on the guys who were killed from the field ambulance, but that's just a few of them that were killed. Um, so the sad part too was a lot of the sick and wounded soldiers who were patients were killed. Because they were on stretchers, they were doctors. Um, and that must have seemed like the literal nail in the coffin for them. They, that happened on the 27th of November. The second Fort Field Ambulance Smith and Bill stayed there until January 17th. They moved into the jungle with another main dressing station and they continued the work for the duration of the beach head campaign which went through into January. Um, so, while they were waiting for your highest beside the Poppin' Dead airstrip for it to be evacuated back to Fort Morrissey, and he's expressed his feelings in his diary that he'd kept since his days in the Middle East. So he talks about how they take the last glimpse. And he also writes, we never want to see or hear of this part of New Guinea again. There are a lot under wooden crosses not coming back with us this trip. So they do make it back to Australia, and my final few chapters in the book summarise the rest of their war and the rest of their lives. But just in summary, to me, there's no doubt that the years in the war with the field ambulance changed Nick from the man he was, influenced the man he became, and determined the man he returned, for better or for worse. More than 80 years on, I think it's a personal effect, like the mementos, the letters, the diary writings, the sketches and the photographs that continue to resonate. And are reminded that those like the Kennedy brothers, who did extraordinary things in extraordinary times, were actually ordinary men and women like us.